we're faced with today. It is my hope that Congress, over the August break, will listen to the American people and work to enact the reforms that achieve real results and make good on the promises made in Washington. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, I rise again for now the 41st time to ask my colleagues to wake up to the threat of climate change. Uh, today I come to discuss the serious risks that climate change poses to our energy sector. It is no controversial idea that our climate affects our energy infrastructure. In the Northeast, when we think about what causes power outages, we naturally think of bad weather. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers reports that between 2007 and 2012, weather-related events were the main cause of electrical outages in the U.S. That same report said the average cost of a one-hour power outage is just over $1,000 for a commercial business, just for one hour. So this takes a serious toll on our economy. A recent Department of Energy report has highlighted just how sensitive our energy sector is to climate change and to extreme weather. In September 2011, the Department of Energy reports, and I'll quote, high temperatures and high electricity demand related loading tripped a transformer and transmission line near Yuma, Arizona, starting a chain of events that led to shutting down the San Onofre nuclear power plant with power lost to the entire San Diego County distribution system, totaling approximately 2.7 million power customers with outages as long as 12 hours. Earlier that summer, the report continues, I'll quote again, consecutive days of triple digit heat and record drought in Texas resulted in the Electric Reliability Council of Texas declaring power emergencies due to a large number of un unplanned power plant outages and at least one power plant reducing its output. The Browns Ferry nuclear plant in Athens, Alabama, the report says, and I'm quoting again, had to reduce power output because the temperature of the Tennessee River, the body of water into which the plant discharges, was too high to discharge heated cooling water from the reactor without risking ecological harm to the river. This happened in 2007, in 2010, in 2011, and in some cases the power production was reduced for nearly two months. The Department of Energy reports that the cost of replacement power for this was estimated at $50 million. It's not just power generation, energy exploration has been affected too. The DOE report explains that last July, and I'll quote, in the midst of one of the worst droughts in American history, certain companies that extract natural gas and oil via hydraulic fracturing faced higher water costs or were denied access to water for six weeks or more in several states, including Kansas, Texas, Pennsylvania, and North Dakota. It was a similar story in the fall of 2011. I'm quoting again. Due to extreme drought conditions, the city of Grand Prairie, Texas, became the first municipality to ban the use of city water for hydraulic fracturing. Other local water districts in Texas followed suit by implementing similar restrictions, limiting city water use during drought conditions. In July of 2011, the report recounts that, and I'll quote again, ExxonMobil's Exxon Mobil's silver tip pipeline buried beneath the Yellowstone River in Montana, was torn apart by flood-caused debris, spilling oil into the river and disrupting crude oil transport in the region. The property damage cost was $135 million. 
Senator Vitter, our ranking member on the Environment and Public Works Committee, has told us that 18 percent of the nation's oil supply passes through his home state of Louisiana at Port Fouchon. A recent Government Accountability Office report found that the only access road to that port is closed three and a half days a year on average due to flooding, effectively shutting down that port. With sea level rise climbing due to climate change, NOAA is now projecting that within 15 years, portions of that highway will flood an average of 30 times each year, again, shutting down access to that port 30 times a year. Vital infrastructure like power plants, power lines, roads, and pipelines are all designed to stand up to historical weather patterns. So what happens when the weather stops following historical patterns? According to the draft National Climate Assessment, I'll quote, U.S. average temperatures have increased by about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit since 1895. More than 80% of this increase has occurred since 1980. The most recent decade was the nation's hottest on record. Oceans and other bodies of water are warming right along with the atmosphere. The seasons are shifting. Research shows that in the last two decades, the frost-free season has increased in every region of the contiguous U.S. compared to the average between 1901 and 1960. In the Southwest, the record shows the frost-free season has increased three weeks. And the Western wildfire season has expanded by more than two months since the 1970s. Precipitation patterns and the availability of water are changing throughout the nation. One study concluded that snow in the western mountains is melting on average one to four weeks earlier now compared to the 1950s. The draft national climate assessment shows that the amount of rain falling in what we call heavy precipitation events, or more colloquially downpours, is up in every region of the nation up 45 percent in the Midwest and 74 percent in the Northeast. Sea level is rising, about eight inches on average globally, but in some parts of the country it's much higher. NOAA reports that mean waters off the Galveston, Texas coast are rising more than two feet per century. And at Grand Isle, Louisiana, the rate is nearly three feet per century. These aren't just projections of what's to come. These are actual measurements of changes that have already happened or are happening around us. The result is that we have an energy infrastructure built for a different climate than the one which now exists and the one which is to come. And conditions are only predicted to get worse. The threat to our energy sector from changes in the climate should be neither controversial nor partisan. There are a lot of common sense solutions here. Adapting our infrastructure for climate change is smart, and it will save us from costly repairs. Investing in energy efficiency by reducing the demand for power will relieve pressure on the burdened systems. Investing in a diverse energy sector will protect against the unique vulnerabilities of specific types of power sources. Rhode Island is part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, nicknamed REGI, along with seven other northeastern states. Our region caps carbon emissions and sells permits to power plants to emit greenhouse gases which creates economic incentives for both states and utilities to invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy development. These efforts also reduce load demand on the region's electrical grid. We are proud of the effort that we're making in New England, 
And I know that a lot of states are working just as hard. But I say to my colleagues, our home states are hampered by the inaction here in Congress. We have received credible and convincing warnings. We have received compelling calls to act. The overwhelming majority of the scientific community recognizes climate change is real, and we're causing it. Our national security and intelligence community, our faith leaders, major American corporations, including the insurance and reinsurance industry, and most Americans all agree we need to act. It is time for Congress to wake up and to do its work to slow the onslaught of climate change and to prepare for what are now unavoidable, inevitable effects. And yet, here in Congress, we sleepwalk on. This is an issue, Mr. President, that I know hits home in your home state in very different ways than it hits home in my home state. But in each of our own ways, our states are already experiencing the hit from climate change. And it's caused by carbon pollution that we are putting up into the air, that our companies, that our smokestacks are launching into the atmosphere, that changes our weather, that changes our temperature, that changes our seasons, that changes our oceans, that changes our waterways, that changes our weather, that changes our lives. And the tragedy here is that we sleepwalk on because we are unwilling to address the special interests that are preventing us from taking the action that all Americans need. This is the archetypal fight between the public good, between an important public security issue and a private special interest that is defending itself, that is defending its right to pollute, that is defending its ability to compromise our atmosphere, compromise our health, compromise our great oceans and waters. This should be an easy struggle. This should be an easy struggle, but it's not. And it will be a mark of shame on this generation, and it will be a mark of shame on this building, that given the choice between the clear information from the scientists, the clear experience of what is happening in all of our states, and the power of the special interests, we ignored the first, and we yielded to that power of those special interests. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Okay, I'll just leave it. just close.
We never ended up. We never ended up going into a quorum call. Mr. President, Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 146, Senate Resolution 156. Clerk will report. Calendar number 146, SRES 156, expressing the sense of the Senate on the 10-year anniversary of NATO Allied Command transformation. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. I further ask that the committee reported substitute be agreed to, the resolution as amended be agreed to, the amendment to the preamble be agreed to, the preamble as amended be agreed to, and the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration and block of the following resolutions which were submitted earlier today, Senate Resolutions 207, 208, 209, 210, and 211. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the resolutions be agreed to, the preambles be agreed to, the motions to reconsider be laid upon the table and block with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. I'll note the well, before I note the absence of quorum, let me express my appreciation uh, to Senator Moran for his patience as we go through the closing script here. Uh, he will have an opportunity to speak at the conclusion of this, and I appreciate very much his courtesy in accommodating us in this way. Note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Senator from Rhode Island. May I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended so that Senator Moran may be recognized and we'll proceed with the closing at the conclusion of his remarks. Without objection. Mr. President, thank you and I thank the gentleman from Rhode Island. Um, <clears throat> three years ago, Congress uh, passed a, a massive health insurance law didn't have a single Republican vote, and it had significant opposition by the public. In an administration proclaiming to be the most transparent ever, this 2,700-page bill was rammed through Congress in the early morning hours on a Christmas Eve. Even then, Speaker of the House Pelosi said that Congress had to pass this bill so that we could find out what's in it. Well, we did, it was passed, and the American people are not liking what they've discovered. While the President promised the Affordable Care Act would lower health care costs and strengthen our health care system, the law instead is increasing health insurance premiums, slowing economic recovery, and hindering job creation. And we should not allow the administration to continue to ignore this reality. We should, we must permanently delay the Affordable Care Act. Since its enactment in 2010, 18 components of the health care law have been changed, canceled, or delayed. The President downplays the law's substantial defects by characterizing them as, quote, glitches and bumps that are to be expected. He also claims that oh, the Affordable Care Act critics are responsible for the law's broken promises by arguing that the problem is, quote, folks out there who are actively working to make this law fail. Meanwhile, the Affordable Care Act is slowly unraveling. Every day brings new information about missed deadlines, funding shortfalls, soaring health insurance premium rates, and a technical implementation that is floundering. It is any wonder that this law continues to be publicly unpopular. With the majority of mandates, fees, and taxes taking effect in 2014, we are already beginning to see the alarming effects of the law on individuals, families, employers, and on our economy. It is a broken promise one after another. 
Promise number one, in attempting to convince American people that the, ACC, the ACA was good, the President promised it would, quote, save families $2,500 in coming years. But since 2008, the average American family has seen health insurance premiums rise more than $3,000. Nonpartisan actuaries estimate that national health spending will grow at an average rate close to 6% annually between 2011 and 2021. As national spending ticks up, American families will continue to see their monthly premiums go up. States are beginning to release details on the rates consumers will pay for ACA-related health insurance starting on January 1st. An unfortunate pattern is emerging. ACA-mandated insurance is going to increase costs for many Americans. Recently, the state of Indiana announced that insurance rates will increase 72% for consumers in their individual market. Consumers in Ohio, Florida, South Carolina, and Maryland have also announced that they are expecting to see their premiums increase significantly. Just yesterday, the Georgia Insurance Commissioner asked the Department of Health and Human Services to extend the deadline to approve health plans in their state because some rates were expected in Georgia to rise by 198%. In my home state of Kansas, I consistently hear concerns from individuals, from business owners, and even local government officials about impending costs of the Affordable Care Act. For example, rural Kansas school districts and special education co-ops whose budgets are already stretched thin, will now be forced to cover the costs associated with the law. This has resulted in reduction of employees' hours and may trigger layoffs in order for the districts to avoid significant ACA-related penalties. It's sad to visit with the director of a special education co-op only to learn that less services are going to be provided to special needs students because of the costs associated with the Affordable Care Act. Mr. President, the American people were promised savings and security, and instead we're experiencing a loss of both. The Affordable Care Act is leaving Americans with less options and simply unaffordable care. A second promise, promise number two, in 2009 the President said, no matter how we reform health care, we will keep the promise that if you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. Reality has since whittled down this promise dramatically. If you go to the Affordable Care Act website today, you will find this far less confident statement. Quote, depending on the plan you choose in the marketplace, you may be able to keep your current doctor, unquote. Mr. President, even large labor unions have recently criticized uh, the President and uh, congressional Democrats for breaking their promise. Notably, the National Treasury Employees Union, the union that represents most IRS employees is urging its members to write their elected officials to oppose any effort that would force them to participate in the health insurance exchange. Further, several unions stated, when you and the President sought our support for the Affordable Care Act, you pledged that if we liked the health plans we have now, we could keep them. Sadly, that promise is under threat. I'm quoting the union. And another statement, Quote, approximately 3 million laborers, retirees, and their families now face the very real prospect of losing their health benefits. This, I must remind you, was something that you promised would not happen, unquote. A third promise, promise number three. The president indicated that the Affordable Care Act would, quote, lower costs for the federal government, reducing our deficit by over a trillion dollars in the next two decades. It is paid for. It is fiscally responsible, unquote. The only way the Affordable Care Act will reduce deficits is by grossly increasing the taxes and fees associated with the law. One wonders how anyone believed at the time that new entitlement program would ever save money. These broken promises are more than just words. The administration's fault starts and early failures in implementing the Affordable Care Act are just the beginning. The harm this law will do to individuals, families, and businesses will continue to emerge. In less than three months, individuals will be asked to start enrolling in health insurance exchange when insurance rates, coverage requirements, and subsidy amounts are still largely unknown. And increasingly, the question is being asked is to what happens to individuals required to buy health insurance or face penalties if the exchanges are not ready on time. I'm the ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services. I offered two amendments. Uh, to the fiscal year 2014 bill that would bring some certainty to, over this, to, to this overreaching, uh, excuse me, this overarching issue. First, I offered an amendment to codify the administration's decision to delay the employer mandate. While many of my colleagues 
on the Democrat side, issued press releases praising the administration's decision to delay. When asked to affirmably vote in the committee to delay for one year, they all voted no. The amendment failed on a straight party line vote. The second amendment I offered delayed the implementation and enforcement of the individual mandate for one year. While I support the delay of the employer mandate, in that decision, like it or not, the administration undermined its own credibility in stating that the Affordable Care Act will be implemented on time as promised. We should not and cannot require individuals to risk their health care coverage by signing up for an unworkable program with a dubious future. Unfortunately, my colleagues again on the Democrat side disagree. They refuse to extend the exemption the President granted to businesses, to employers, to all Americans, to families and to individuals. The evidence continues to show that the Affordable Care Act is so large and so convoluted that it cannot be implemented into practice. Reports from state actuaries, the Congressional Budget Office, Government Accountability Office, and nonpartisan think tanks have reached the same conclusion. Almost everything we were told about the Affordable Care Act is untrue. Mr. President, we were told three years ago that we need to pass the Affordable Care Act to find out what's in it. Now we know, and it's not good. We don't need to force American families to endure another three years just to see how bad it actually will be. Mr. President, I uh, notice the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Senator from Rhode Island. Quorum call be lifted. Without objection. And may I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it adjourn until 9.30 a.m. on Thursday, August 1, 2013, and that following the prayer and pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day, and that following any leader remarks, the Senate be in a period of morning business until 11 o'clock a.m., with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, and that following morning business, the Senate proceed to executive session to consider calendar number 96, the Chen nomination under the previous order. Finally, that the second degree filing deadline for amendments to S1243 be 11 o'clock a.m. tomorrow. There will be two roll call votes at noon tomorrow, confirmation of the Chen nomination, and cloture on the THUD bill. Additionally, there will be a vote in the afternoon on confirmation of the power nomination. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order. Senate stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. on Thursday, August the 1st. The Senate today approved the nomination of Todd Jones to be director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. The vote was held open all afternoon, waiting for North Dakota Senator Democrat Heidi Heitkamp to cast the 60th vote needed for cloture. The Senate is back tomorrow. Watch live Senate coverage again here on C-SPAN 2.